Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, it's afternoon. Praise the Lord. I've been to two services this morning. This is the second, you see, so I don't know where I am. Uh, it's wonderful to be here uh, with you this afternoon. It really is a privilege. Um, I'm very impressed, not just with this facility, but with everybody I've met. Uh, Robbie and Karen especially have been so hospitable. I came here on a little plane from Belfast, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get back on it again if they keep... <laughs> feeding me the way they have been doing. Um, so I just introduced myself. I mean, I, I, as you know, I'm from a place called Derry in Northern Ireland on the border there with Donegal. I'm married to Nicola. We have four children. Um, we've been married now for 34 years this year. And this year as well, we become grandparents, praise the Lord, which is something really wonderful. And um, so I got to get used to that sound. Praise the Lord. Good practice. So thinking back, actually, over the years, I mean, we have four children, and um, I guess this year I'm going to turn 60 on Christmas Eve. And so for 60 years, I've been going to church. It's a long time to go to church, isn't it? But for the first 27 years, um, I guess I could say I believed in God, but I didn't know Him. And then uh, at the age of 27... Myself and Nicola had a wonderful encounter with the Holy Spirit where she was healed of a disease that had crippled her for three years, and I came into a realization that you could know our Heavenly Father, and knowing Him made all the difference in the world, you know. Now, we'd both trained as vets in London, and uh, I remember one of our lecturers who taught us about sheep, and he said, you know, we know 50 diseases of sheep. The trouble is they know 100 and so it's good to remember that whatever you think you know, there's much, much more to know. The Apostle Peter wrote these beautiful words. He said, do not fall into error, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, no matter what age you are, there is so much more to know about the goodness of God. And the Bible says as we humble ourselves, grace comes, praise God. You know, as we hold our hands up and say, God, I need, I need you more, as we sang that. I need to know more of you. Up comes this beautiful Holy Spirit who resides in the believer, praise God. Uh, remember John the Baptist said of Jesus, I was told the one in whom I see the Spirit remain, praise God. And that's your life and my life. may not feel like that all the time, but the moment we bow our heads and say, Lord, he's here, praise God. And, and that's our experience this morning when we come to worship. In the first service, I was so blessed because... The minister who was here mentioned John Bunyan, and I wanted to begin today by quoting you John Bunyan. You know who he is, famous author of Pilgrim's Progress, and 400 years ago, he wrote a little rhyme, which has come to mean a lot to me. He said these words, run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. Praise God. That's something so beautiful. And I wanted to speak this morning about that ability of the gospel to actually give us wings. You know, uh, I grew up, as I said, in church, and every Sunday in church, I heard a gospel that didn't appear to give me wings. It didn't lift me. And, you know, by the time I was a teenager, most of my friends had left church because the God we kept hearing about wanted more from us. You know, he was, he was a father who kept asking for more and more, but I couldn't quite see what he had given me. I didn't understand the enormity of what he had given me in Christ. And to see that lifts you. It lifts you out of yourself. It's such a powerful thing. You know, recently I was reflecting on that, on the way the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And the strange thing was, and I know you probably heard this as well, many people find it very difficult to relate to Father God because they didn't have a good father themselves. I understand that. It's increasingly common in the age that we live in. But for me, it was slightly different. The thing that really spoke to me and began to move my heart to seek after him was that the, the father I was hearing about 
in the church wasn't as good as my own father. My own father so gracious that I knew that if I went to him, no matter what I'd done, he would never throw me out. I'd always be his son. He didn't appear to relate to me on the basis of my behavior. And so, knowing about how good my father was, there was something in me wanted to search for a father like that. So, although all my compatriots left church at a young age, I kept going because something in me knew there's got to be more than this. He's got to be a better father than that, you know? Praise God. I remember when I was 11 years of age, around about that time, and I was in church one Sunday, and I was in awe of the way people were worshiping God. And I said, I I want to know this God. I want to know him. And when I thought when that would be, a really strange thought came to me, very strange for a 10 or 11 year old. I had this thought, when I have children, that's when I'll know him. Because it felt to me the most shameful thing in the world if a child of mine ever came to me and said, now daddy, you tell me what he's like. And for me to look at my own child and go, You're going to have to find somebody else to tell you, I don't know. Something in me, as a a little boy, I thought, I'm never going to do that. I could never do that. I want to know by then. That was my little thought as an 11-year-old. Never thought about it again. Fast forward 15 years, and within weeks of my first child being born, Christopher, I came to know the Lord, you know. It's almost like somebody in heaven wrote that down. Be careful what you pray. Little alarm clock went off all those years later. See that guy down there? (laughs) Praise God. So it's it's a beautiful thing. But as I said, every message I sat under kept telling me what he wanted from me. The Bible says that it's the generosity of God that leads men to repentance. We sang it this morning, the goodness of God. To know how good he is is what changes our mind about him. Praise God. So the Holy Spirit was at work in my life, and he was at work in your life long before we give him permission to be so. That's very encouraging when we think of family and friends, isn't it? Perhaps when you think maybe they're they're, they're far from God. Holy Spirit's at work in people's lives. That's why when you have the boldness to share the gospel, he confirms that to them. Praise God. They somehow know in their knower that what you're saying is true. It's a beautiful thing. So the gospel gives men wings Praise God. Uh, It it lifts us. And I think we all have this experience. The revelation of the generosity of God lifts me out of thinking I'm being obsessed with myself and my past. When I see that he's good enough to love me irrespective of my past, my past loses its grip on me. I'm no longer defined, defined by what they did to me or what I did, because his love is greater. He seems to relate to me, not according to my record, but according to his, according to Christ's. He sees me in a different light. He doesn't see me in the light of what I have done or haven't done. He sees me in the light of what Christ has done. It's a different type of light to be seen by. I remember reading once the testimony of St. Patrick. I'm going to be Irish now, tell you about St. Patrick. St. Patrick wrote these words. He said, I was like a stone stuck in the mud, and in his mercy, he came and he lifted me up, and he exalted me to the highest place and sat me on top of the wall, and from there, I will speak about him. I think that's beautiful, you know? That's the gospel that we preach. It's not a gospel that says you need to pick yourself up out of the mud. It's a gospel that says he picked us out of the mud. He is the one who lifted us up, praise God. It's a gospel that lifts our eyes onto him, Praise God. When we could do nothing about the muck and the mud that we were in, we have a Savior. He came into the mud, rose out of the mud, ascended to the highest place, and took us with him. Can anybody say amen this morning? So beautiful. So now your life is now hidden with Christ and God, as Paul said to the Colossians. And from that place, from the top of the wall, I want to speak. From the top of the wall, I want to think. On my worst day, When everything's gone pear-shaped, I'm still living from there, the top of the wall. That's where I'm going to speak from. And as I speak from that place and live from that place and smile from that place and laugh from that place and cry from that place, but as people see that you're living from that place, it calls other people up. That it's possible to live from a place where you're no longer a victim. No matter what's gone wrong in your life, that doesn't define you anymore because he tells you who you are. And he is the one that he gave everything for, for you. 
Praise God. He's the one who has not held anything back from you. That was the original lie in the garden. Well, you know, God hasn't given you everything. But there's something you could do to make him. No. The cross nailed that lie. Look to the cross. That's him giving you everything. And not when you deserved it, but before you did one thing to earn it. For God demonstrates his love in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Praise God. He gave us everything at the beginning. Why at the beginning? Because he never wanted us to get the idea that somehow we could earn it, that somehow his love was conditional on our performance. That's a very dangerous idea to get because you'll spend your life with your hope in yourself rather than in him. It's a subtle thing, really, you know, and it's something we, only by the grace of God, he keeps bringing us back to that place. In this world you will have trouble, Jesus said, but be of good cheer. Strange thing to say, isn't it? Because I have overcome the world, you know? But I think that my experience of the grace of God, and when I say that word grace, I'm talking about the empowering presence of God, you know? Because it's his life in you that enables us to be in him and to live this life, you know? If you're trying to be a Christian, that's an expression of unbelief. You you can't in your own strength, you know? Everybody knows that here. We've all been to the end of ourselves. That's how we began this journey, by getting to the end of ourselves. How do you want to be renewed? Get to the end of yourself again. Never think because you've been a Christian five years, 15 years, or 50 years that you know how to do it. You cannot do anything apart from me, Jesus said. So here's the good news. I'll never leave you. I'll never leave you. I always say to our folk, you know, the Lord is not asking you this year or any year to do one thing for him. He only asks us to do everything with him. And that's the biggest difference in the world. It's a beautiful thing, you know. I guess maybe it's why Scripture talks a lot about marriage and and how people come together as one life and and how they begin to carry each other's life, you know. And, And it is something so beautiful like that. Praise God. I don't know how far I'll get this morning. I wanted to tell you three things about the gospel from Romans 1. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans 1, verse 16 and 17. You know this verse so well. Ruthlin, you know this verse, praise the Lord. Paul wrote that he said, I'm not ashamed of this gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, I want to show you three things this morning about the gospel, because By the grace of God, no matter how many times I'm given the privilege of being here, I have to tell you, I've only got one message. I might as well own up now. Christ and him crucified. I'm never going to stand here and tell you what you should be doing. I'm only going to point to him. Because when you see what he's done, you'll be a different person. That's all I can find. Fix your eyes on him. The author and the finisher of your faith. He's not asking you or I to finish something he began. No matter how many years you've had that impression sometimes from being around church, he's not asking you to finish something he began. He said, it's not you running off by yourself to finish something I began. We're married. You're married to him that you may bear fruit to him. Paul wrote that to the Romans too, didn't he? So the first thing he says here about the gospel is, I'm not ashamed. Why should he say that? Because no minister who preaches a gospel that says God will bless you according to your works, according to your obedience, according to your righteousness, is ever in danger of being told he should be ashamed of himself. And that's because any gospel that promises more blessings for more effort sounds eminently reasonable to the earthly man whose hope has always been in himself. As I said again, you've got to get to the end of yourself. Praise God. To get to the end of yourself. In this story of the prodigal son, it's actually two sons getting to the end of themselves, isn't it really? One gets to the end of himself in the pig pen and says, I can't do it anymore. If I stay here, I'm going to die. But the other religious good boy, elder brother, who stayed at home and worked all his life, he gets to the end of his tether when he sees the welcome for his brother. He says, I I give up. I've worked and slaved all my life. I've never got a skinny goat. (laughs) And the end of the story, Jesus has him standing in the field. But notice Jesus doesn't tell us if he goes into the party or not. I think that's because he's speaking. He says, it's your decision. 
Are you going to get, get over yourself? Get over your 50 years of serving God and just go back to where you began? I can do nothing apart from him and enter into his joy over you because of what he has done, not because of what you and I have done. Praise God. So I'm not ashamed of that gospel. You know, here's a quote from the renowned preacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He once famously said this, if the gospel you're preaching doesn't cause you to be misunderstood and slanderously reported as being against the law, then you don't believe the gospel truly and you don't preach it truly. (laughs) Because it sounds like that. If you're hearing it properly, it does. It sounds like God has set you free. You know, once when I got this revelation of the gospel, I remember sometimes, I think I was saying this to you, Rob, I remember rehearsing conversations with people because I thought to myself, I can't tell people this. It's too good. (laughs) Can't tell people this. I know what they'll say to me. They'll say, oh, so you're just saying we can do what we want then. And my reply would be, no, I, I, I'm not saying you can do what you want. And the Holy Spirit always used to check me. And eventually I got it. He was saying, Phelan, I want them to do what they want. I want them to follow me. I want them to follow me because they want to, not because they ought to. You know, if I turned to my wife, Nicola, and said, listen, I want you to be absolutely honest with me. Why did you marry me? And she said, you really want the truth? I wanted to escape England. You you married me because you wanted to escape somewhere. That's it, is it? (laughs) Well, what does he think about when the best we can bring is, well, I just didn't want to go to hell, you know, so I want to. I think he saved us for a little bit more than that. It's why we have the Holy Spirit, that you might know him, praise God. Paul said, I press on towards the prize of knowing him. Jesus said, this is eternal life. It's knowing him. It's knowing him. Wow, that means eternal life doesn't start the day I die. It starts in knowing him. And it flows through me by knowing him, you know. And and the more I, I see how blessed he is, the more I'm living this life. Because this is the life they share, Father, Son, and Spirit. It's so beautiful. Oh, my goodness, I'm so far behind. I better go on to the second thing. The second thing that this tells us about the gospel It's power. I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. It gives us wings, as John Bunyan said. So the power of the gospel is that through this full proclamation of what Christ has done, that really he has put us, the old I life, to death, and he's raised us up to an entirely new life. Through seeing that, it lifts you out of your past and your natural circumstances, you know. The gospel declares that in Christ, he lifted us out of the mud. Can you say amen this morning? He, lifted, he put us on the top of the wall, and we can live from there, and we can speak from there. And wow, if this is true, if he spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not? How shall he not, with him, freely give us all things? You see, it's knowing that you already have that that changes your life. Jesus, the last lesson he taught his disciples was he got down and he washed their dirty feet. Nobody else in the room would do that. You know why? Because they were afraid that it would mean that they were somehow less. He was able to do it, John wrote, for this reason. Knowing where he had come from and knowing where he was going and knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, he got down on his knees and washed dirty feet. So we can serve when it's not about us anymore. You know that you know that you know who you are, you know. A friend of mine told me a story years ago about during the French Revolution, they were chopping people's heads off, and they took a 12-year-old boy who was a prince. He was the son of the king, and they were going to execute him. But he was such a good boy, they decided that if they did that, he'd go straight to heaven. And they really hated him so much. So they, apparently, the story goes, they turned him over to an old lady who was reputed to be a witch, and they told her, teach him how to blaspheme God, and then we'll kill him. And they came back after two weeks, and this little boy had refused to say any of the bad things this woman was teaching him. He refused. And eventually they said, listen, just get it over with. Why don't you say it? Just say those things, and it'll all be over. Little boy looked at him and says, I can't. Why not? Because I'm the son of a king. The son of a king doesn't speak like that. If you're trying to be a Christian, it's an expression of unbelief. When you get a revelation that you're a believer, not because of your new behavior, but because of your new birth, 
then you can stop trying to be a Christian and start living as a child of God. Because it's all by grace. Praise God. Now, when that gets hold of your heart, you're changed from the inside out. The inside out. Because when it, Jesus said, I came to take an ax to the root, not the branches. That's our behavior. What you're doing today, this week, everything you did this week that you wouldn't talk about in church, that's not the root. That's just the branches. Those things grew out of fear. They grew out of fear. If I did something or said something that wasn't glorifying to God, I did it out of pure fear. I thought I had to to save myself, you see? So God says, perfect love will cast that out. Let me take an ax to the root. It's what you're believing. It's not what you're doing. It's what you're believing, you know? So I want to show you again what a good father you have. And the Holy Spirit is the one who does that. Because Jesus says this, I promise you, I'll not leave you as orphans. I'll not leave you not knowing your daddy. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And when you know how good your father is, you will be as your father is. When I, I became a vet because I wanted to be like my father. He was a veterinary surgeon. That's not a great idea. It's not a good reason to be a vet because your dad was a vet. I struggled through it for years. I realized at the end I wasn't cut out. I, I did all that. I sacrificed all that. I did all those exams because I wanted to be like my father. And you know what? The older I get, I look more like him without doing a single thing. <laughs> That's just DNA. Well, if you have received his spirit, put your faith in the seed not in your gardening skills. Have more faith in the Holy Spirit, the one who carries you through every situation. And I think what really helps me is to hear those beautiful words that he's delighted in you, that he loves you, that he knows you, and he's accepted you, and he's not measuring you. The worst atmosphere you can ever be in is a measuring atmosphere. It'll measure you to death, you know? When you're even in a room, perhaps, and you feel a word from God and you want to share it, if you have a, a people around you who love you and have accepted you, you can speak. But if you think you're going to be measured, you'll clam up. So God wants to give us such a revelation that our Father in heaven is cheering us on. Praise God. Not that he's taking notes going, huh? <laughs> Could do better. <laughs> Did you ever have that written in your school report? Could do better. Third thing, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. Praise God. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So the third thing that Paul speaks about the gospel is what's in it. It's a different type of righteousness. Praise God. A different order of righteousness. It's not self-righteousness. It's God's righteousness. It's a righteousness so great that you can only have it as a gift. And if you refuse to take it as a, grif a gift, you can't have it. You must take it as a gift. And I think actually, as you received him, Paul wrote, so walk in him. So it's not that you receive it as a gift at the beginning, but then for the rest of your life, it's back to earning it. No, you continue to say every day, my God, there but for the grace of God go I. And his grace is more than sufficient because his grace is not a thing that he gives while he steps back. His grace is his very presence. That's the wonderful thing about the gift of the Holy Spirit or even the gift of speaking in tongues. Open your mouth and see he's kept his promise. He's made his home with you and I. Such a beautiful thing, you know. If a child of yours was in hospital, would you be content to send him a text going praying for you? <laughs> what do you think they think about that? You'd move heaven and earth to be where they are. That's the God we have. Other religions may have a God in the sky. We don't. Our hope is not Christ in heaven one day. Our hope is Christ in us today. Praise God. And that's his hope for the world. Let thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It's not about us getting out of here to go to heaven. Hey, we have something much better than heaven. Come on. When I go home, I have a lovely home. But I don't go home for my home. I go home for who's in the home. Praise the Lord. And he has said, he, I've made my home with you. This is, this is too big for me. I can't take this in like you can't take this in. I don't understand this. I need his Holy Spirit. And as I continue to hear this beautiful gospel, I grow up to be who he says that I am. Little XL Dave. And we were chatting about this the other night. He, he will grow up to be the person whom his parents keep telling him he is. And even though he may behave like a dog for a few years, he is not a dog. 
And even though you believe her, you might go out there and behave like a dog. You're not a dog. And you see what's going to change your behavior? It's not hearing you're a dog. Stop, stop doing dog things. No, it's hearing who you are. And that's why the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians who were behaving like dogs. No, you're not. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Why are you behaving like mere men? You see, don't go for the branches, go for the root. He says, I come to take an axe to the root. Do you know who you are? I give you my Holy Spirit that you would know me, and in knowing me, you will know who you are. Praise God. Let me try and bring this to a close. God in heaven sees things totally different because he sees that what Christ has done is enough. And when we begin to see from a heavenly perspective, we can begin to see too that what Christ has done is enough. It's enough. It's enough for me to be free from myself, free from my attempts to save myself. If you were, God forbid, drowning in a river and you cried out for help, and I came to the bank and stood there and shouted instructions to you as to how you could save yourself, would that have been your idea of a savior? We don't have a savior who stands on the bank every Sunday and shouts instructions to you as to how you can save yourself. We have one who dived in and wrapped his arms around us and held us in and himself and brought us to a safe place. We have one who went into the mud and rose out of the mud. And that's why Paul wrote those beautiful words to the Colossians, you know. If you have been raised with Christ, then set your eyes on things above. Live from there. For you died, and your life now is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, I think those are the most beautiful words in Scripture. Christ, who is your life. I can't find more powerful words than that in the whole Bible. Christ, who is your life, you know. Christ, who is your life. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you will be just like him. Praise God. You will appear with him. So beautiful. I want to pray and make a declaration over you this morning. I want to thank God for you. Let's bow our heads for a moment. I'm just going to wait on the Holy Spirit. Bless you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, it's your will for this beautiful place of Inverness that you would have a people here, your children who know who they are, whose faces are radiant with peace, who, whose lives are like bright stars shining in a dark place because they are at peace with you. They are at one with you. And I thank you, Lord, that I'm looking at these people this morning, and I thank you for your great purpose and your great heart for them which is not that you're going to bless them when they do something more, but that they are blessed. They are blessed. We cannot be more blessed. We have been blessed in the heavenly realm with every blessing in Christ Jesus. And Father, I just thank you for such a revelation of that to well up in this place that it would become like an atmosphere of heaven would be in this place. This would be the house of music and dancing. This would be the Father's house. And everybody who, who comes, when I say this place, I mean these people, Lord. Their lives, they are the church. And wherever they go in this town, wherever they go in this country, there would be such an atmosphere coming from them of peace and of joy that people would be attracted to them, that they would be attracted to the joy of the Father in them. For, Lord, you said, rejoice with me, for what was lost has been found, and what was dead is alive so, Father, we rejoice with you this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit that our, even our physical bodies would be responding to the joy that's welling up within us. Lord, you said wherever this river flows, both banks will blossom. So, Father, I just thank you that as this word of life springs up in these dear people physically, in, in every way, in their souls, in their bodies, they would blossom. We pray for those who aren't here today for sickness, Lord. We pray for those who, who are struggling in their mind or in their body. And we say, what you have done is enough. What you have done is enough. And so by speaking to each other, we draw up that beautiful life within each other. 
Deep calls unto deep. And so I just speak the blessing of God over you in this beautiful place, Father, Son, and Spirit. And I declare you are his children, and he delights over you. And he has nothing but good things for you and to say over you. And the best thing is that he has given you his beautiful spirit. And that spirit is a spirit that casts out fear. So, Father, I just thank you for that wonderful growing up, that there would be a people here of such peace that this town is blessed by the light that's emanating from their lives, that drives back every bit of darkness, every bit of division, every bit of consternation. I thank you for a well of thanksgiving in this place, such thanksgiving, which is like the immune system of the believer, that no matter what happens, no matter what's said or done, nothing can take from them this beautiful thanksgiving. For I declare over you, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, to give thanks in all circumstances. So, Father, we just thank you for your Holy Spirit. We just agree that, Lord, the good work you've begun in our lives, you are completing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. I thank you for the gifts of prophecy in this place. I thank you, Lord, that it's the most natural thing in the world to speak from the heavenly realm when your mind is set in that place. So I thank you, Lord, for all the beautiful days that they will gather in this place and their minds to be set on things above that they would speak from above, that they would think from above, that they would sing from above, that they would live from above, and that their lives would call others out of darkness and into the glorious light. We declare this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Isn't he good? Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, he's better than I ever thought he was. Come on. (laughs) That's what it is to grow, isn't it? To grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Every person here is approved. You're approved. You can tick off the box. Praise God. You have to judge yourself. Do not compare yourselves with each other. It's not wise, the Bible says. You're unique. You're a unique work of God. And you're here because God needs you to be you. Not a copy of me or Robbie or Karen to be you. Because every person is gifted in a beautiful way. And never think... Sometimes because you're not here, nobody would miss you. When you're here, it draws out the word. I didn't mean to say all of that this morning. I'm saying it because somebody here needs to hear it. And that's what we do, you see. When you're with each other, you draw out that life from each other. It's a beautiful thing being together, isn't it? It's a beautiful thing. So don't worry about what you'll wear. or Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap. And yet look how your father looks after them. Are you not more valuable than they are? Praise the Lord. Okay, I'm starting now, so I better stop. (laughs) Praise the Lord.